<laughs> All right, so glad to have you have you with us, uh, partner, partner in crime. We're, we're, we're gonna have a, a good session then regarding numbers, metrics, investments, how to how to really dig into these numbers, no? Um, so, so thank you all for, for joining in, uh, for all those people following us on Facebook Live. Also, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you and spending a, a little bit of time talking about the, the art of what's a good investment, understanding some of the basic metrics and how to read an investment report, which is something so important and relevant in, the, in this business for the investor and obviously for all the professionals that are, are trying to become advisors and consultants for the investment side. So we now, without further ado, uh, want to, to um, present to you guys Enrique as well uh, as part of, uh, part of this uh, uh, webinar and uh, get started uh, today. So, so just to give you a little bit of what, what's gonna go down we're gonna go very quickly into some of the basics that some of you guys have already seen uh, several times on um, what's you know the, the the what's the perspective that we need to have and the fundamentals before we start digging into the numbers uh, on what a good investment could be because it's all it all depends on the customer the type of uh, uh, property you're trying to get to and what an investment is in general because you're always comparing you're always comparing investments uh, It's not only real estate that you're considering so we have to go and and, and, and put a little bit of perspective uh, Before we dig into to the numbers specifically so so to, to get started with that and I, I'm just going to go ahead and get started and many of you guys have seen this chart many times uh, I just want to bring to light that before we, we just start, people ask us, okay, is this a good investment? Is that a good investment? Before we always have to put things into perspective uh, and, and, and things are always better or worse than something else and for a different purpose. So depends on the purpose of the investment. Uh, some people uh, make investments sometimes to lose a lot of cash because it's gonna help them in their taxes. Uh, but but that you know that was a good investment for them because they were gaining in another in an other part of their whole investment scenario and strategy. But 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 so so isolating an investment is a very big mistake. So one of the big first pointers that we want to leave you with is you're always comparing. So uh, as far as is real estate a good or bad investment as as a, as a whole? Well, depends. Depends on what 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 are your your goals depends on what your money is doing somewhere else, depends on the level of risk and volatility you're willing to, to take. And, and that's why it's always important for you guys and for everybody that's looking into investing in real estate to understand what other investments look like and how to compare them in, in real estate. Some of the aspects that always we, we want to point out in real estate are, are, are you know, the high cash returns versus uh, you know, the stock market and bond market that, that don't really necessarily allow you to ju just just uh, have the, the high cash returns that in the, the same way that real estate then you have obviously uh, the equity build up the leverage that you can take from real estate that's very different from several of these other investments you know the fact that you have a hard asset that you can touch you can feel you can understand who's bringing you the revenue go and meet him instead of just having uh, a bubble that that you don't know why why your investment's going up and down and it's not complicated to address the reasons why your investment is working out there's a lot of tax advantages etc so we're not here today to explain to you uh because we've done it many times before and this conversation compared to other things but we wanted to illustrate in this chart the fact that it's always important to have a mindset of comparison. It's always better or worse or higher or lower or more flexible, less flexible, more liquid, less liquid uh, with this other advantages or less other advantages than something else. I don't know uh, if Enrique, you want to add something yeah, to this, no, but very, that's just the idea. Very good points. And uh, I think, um, you know, some, some of the interesting factors of real estate, although we're in it and we're probably biased by saying this, um, when you look at the reality and what we're going to show you in this presentation, you'll realize some of the incredible benefits and returns of real estate compared to other 
you know, vehicles in a longer period of time, you know, and I think uh, you, you were addressing something of the tax shelters and um, the, the way that you sometimes invest to lose money to offset your, your tax returns. And, you know, real estate is uh, predominantly where the biggest tax shelters are head, uh, head because, um, or held, sorry, because of the fact that in real estate, I could be losing money in income, Andres, but my, my, my property can have more appreciation over time. So yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm running a negative cash flow or I'm breaking even or I'm making a little bit of money, but when I depreciate the actual investment, right, the depreciation, which is basically grabbing the sale, the purchase price, dividing it by 27.5 years in residential or 33 years in commercial, if I divide that, then all of a sudden I have negative income. And you might have a person in a tax bracket of 250 to 300,000 that might be taxed a certain rate. And by dropping their income, you know, to 240 or 230,000, all of a sudden you're out of that tax bracket. And it's used as a great tool to preserve wealth, create wealth, but yet at the same time, you know, it, it decrease the actual taxable income that you could generate. So it's an amazing product line when you see it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. I love it. I would put all my money into real estate and you guys will see some of the volatilities and returns and, and some of the things you're going to see. And you'll see exactly where my hunch comes from it. And hopefully you guys can share that and transmit that over to your investors. Yeah. And, and the depreciation is key because you can get a cash flow, but you're losing money because at the end of the day, you're making the money, but in your tax returns, it, when you depreciate, you could be I mean, showing right. a lot. Right, right. Exactly. And you don't, pay, you don't pay on the appreciation, so it's beautiful, right? Exactly. So as you're comparing, remember, one of the things that it's very relevant right now, and, and when you're comparing with other types of assets, and if you look at a 20-year annualized total return and 20-year annualized volatility of different asset classes, uh, the relationship between return uh, and uh, volatility, it, it, it's humongous in real estate. Although the publicly traded stocks have shown under a period of 20 years uh, a point higher in terms of um, returns, uh, the second one in line is real estate compared to the other assets as far as returns. You see there 8.55% in real estate, 9.55% in, in, uh, in the stock market that's publicly held. If you look at volatility, the publicly traded companies goes way above 10% volatility where real estate is just above 5%. So, so that's, that's a big thing uh, when you're looking and for security. You know? And I think that this one, this is what takes it home to me, you know, to, to have a 1% difference, right? In my return on investment. And, and obviously these graphs are 20 year amortized returns. So when we really look at things on a longer base, yes, I could have had a stock run at a certain point where I made 30% of my money, I double my money, et cetera, et cetera. But the same way you make the volatility that hits you coming down is very, very, very strong. While in real estate volatility, if you see, it's, it's actually compared to a treasury bond here, right? It's just a little bit above the treasury bond, but you're making double. Now I'm making one point on a publicly traded stock, 1% more over a 20 year period, but my volatility is much, 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 it's, it's more than double in real estate. So when you start considering, you know, publicly traded companies, equities, the treasury markets, this is why I say I love real estate. I would always put my money in it. And I think it's ingenious how people in Central and South America think that they always want to have that piece of real estate. And when you end up thinking about how simple the business is, what is real estate? You buy a property, you go knock on a door every month and you collect your money. Like that, that's the essence of the business. Granted, there's probably better ways to, to do certain things and, and you know, position yourself. And that's where you want a good team that elects great properties. You want a good team that preserves and conserves the value of the actual property and helps appreciate it. And is always maximizing the value. At the end of the day, the simplicity of that business is something that we can give down from family member to family member to family member. And when you start looking at, you know, our families in Central and South America, Andres, that's kind of the hand-me-downs that you're getting. You get a terreno, you get this, you get that, and that, that kind of fluctuates towards time. Um, so it's amazing to see those concepts, and it's that drive where I think you guys in today's market, it, the investment, whether the market goes up or down, especially with the volatility of all the other markets, it's such a secure place to put your money to be able to make a decent return.
Um, and, and the reason why we're putting these type of graphs also and, and putting it again is because when you're analyzing numbers, and we're going to get very deep into those uh, to the certain level without taking it too complex. So we're trying to, you know, put it as simple as possible within the main metrics that you guys will be able to understand. Uh, uh, at this level, uh, it, it's important that you understand that numbers and data make uh, conclusions. And, and when you're showcasing things, if you just isolate one variable, it, it's impossible to know whether it's a good investment or a bad investment. You always have to compare it with something else. Okay? Yeah. Guys, please, uh, mute, mute, mute yourself. Host, could you mute so everybody, please? Hello. Okay, I'm I'm here. All right, Enrique, unmute yourself. Okay, there we go. And so we're always saying, you know, it's not the art of sales, it's not the art of negotiation, it's the art of comparison. Remember, we would always say that, and this is very true. Yes. When you isolate something and you don't give, why is this a good deal? Show me, show me, right? And we always talk about the five tactics of showing what the importance is of the comparison approach because it all falls there. At the end of the day, we, we can't make deals happen unless we're giving enough information and creating that airtight, logical case with the consumer, right? And that all comes with what Andres said. You have to compare. So when you're talking about a, an investment in real estate, if you just talk about real estate, Okay, great. I got the picture there, but I've heard that my friend has said the stock market gives me better returns or I've heard. And when you put it together the way we have it on this slide, which FYI, we take pictures of this and, and we'll obviously give it out. This is where, yeah, Andres, it does give you much more, but look at the risk that you're taking. It's double the volatility. You're taking twice as much risk to just generate one point more. That doesn't make any sense. And if you want to be extremely conservative on your investments, you look at the fixed um, NCR uh, EIFs, and that's, you know, it's, it's a 4.55% return with the most minimal volatility, right? And this is, would be the most conservative place to put your money. And granted, guys, this is 20 years ago. I mean, I'm not, sorry, not 20 years ago. In a 20-year stretch. Today, that, the treasury bonds are not even paying you that anymore, Andres. No, of course not. They're, they're paying you not. much less. So when yeah. you're considering all these factors, you know, you have to put and shine out why real estate is that logical you know, airtight investment for the investor on your side. And these are the cases that bring that to light. That's very important to transmit over. Yeah. Now, uh, something also that we've, we've, we've shown before, and we're going to spend too much time on this. And by the way, if you have questions, please feel free to write them down in the chat. And we're, trying, we're going to try to address most of them at the end of the, of the session. Uh, we'll do our very best for that. It's always understanding there's different types of investors. So understanding who you're talking to is going to make uh, your argument a little bit uh, more uh, convincing, less convincing, more, more, you're going to have to focus more on some things versus others because all these investments have several variables. And we're going to talk about the numbers in each of the, in, in, the, in, in, in general, in the real estate investment in a little bit. Uh, but it's very important also the fundamental of understanding who your investor is and asking the right questions uh, before you start just uh, pounding on, on solutions and, and, and giving uh, results or, 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 or judgment on an investment, no? So you have the emotional investor or because it's somebody that's buying on emotion because they're going to live in it, they're going to use it, it's for their business, it's their the, it's, it's the warehouse that they're going to use for their own business or it's the office that they're going to use for them or their house. And when emotion comes into place, there's different variables that make this a better or a worse uh, um, uh, investment, no? Because there's different variables that you have to take into account. And then you're no longer just looking at numbers, but also at the emotional factors. Then the rest of the investment in type of investors here will not look at emotion. And then you have somebody that wants to rely more on the cash flow side and it's looking more for that income, whether it's income positive or income negative, no? Because you might, as we said before, want to get the negative part of the real estate side. And that's why the billionaires and all the big players really want to hold assets in real estate because when they need to lose money for some purposes, it's the best asset that allows them to do that while losing, uh, 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 losing money tax-wise and not, and, and not in, in reality, no? So 
uh, you have uh, cash flow. You have people that are looking more for the appreciation and you're, and, and you're playing the appreciation game, the visionaries, the people that are trying to play the market, uh, which also exists in the stock market. In everything that you do in terms of investments, there's also those players that are looking for the, the, the big ap appreciation plays, the flippers, etc. You have and, and the variables for that type of investment, although they're the same when you're looking at the numbers, the weight that you put on one part of the investment is different than the weight that you put on the other. So, so we're going to then be talking about variables, but without us giving you this, uh, it's going to look at it as a one side, uh, side speak all, and we should not look at it like that because the key is understanding your investor will allow you to understand the weight that each of these ratios that you're going to see or each of these uh, um, numbers uh, is going to have. Then yeah, you have the, uh, yeah, Enrique, go for it. And, and no, and I think it's a, a good point of view because one, one of the things that I try to do is, is we stop listening to what people want and start listening to what they need, right? And, and I think identifying where the investor stands will help you guide them to that right place, right? Because Andres and I get a lot of people that are the emotional investor. They want to buy the, the Brickle apartment. And then we, we talk to them and we say, well, why do you want that? Well, because I want to use it. Whatever. That. So what about if we move the money in a way where these apartments or this investment can pay for that? Now you're not taking money out of your pocket. And we're making what we call sound tight investments, which now we don't have an investor calling us every month saying, oh my God, this is costing me so much money. This is crazy. Uh, you have an investment that takes care of itself. All of it pays everything. They don't ever have to take money out of their pocket. And it's that beautiful win-win situation when we hear the other side of it, Andres, and you've had people that you've, I know that in, in, in your circle, you've told, do not do this. Do not just buy the apartment, buy it this way. They end up buying it. And now they're calling you today crying saying, oh my God, this is costing me a ton of money. The market's completely falling. This is just a completely bad investment. And this is where Andres uh, tells you, understanding the types comes a lot from where they find themselves as a perception. It doesn't mean where they're going to end up because the emotional one, usually if they need to invest and create wealth and, and, and a lot of people do, you end up making them an actual investor and teaching them how you make the investments that pay that beautiful lifestyle you want to pay the passive income. I don't know if you guys have read a book, the rich, uh, what is it? Poor dad, rich dad, uh, I forgot rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. Yeah. Rich dad, poor dad. It's a fantastic book that talks a lot about these scenarios where, you know, live off your passive income and that's where you strategize with them and you set them up uh, in the right way. Correct. So, so, so it's very important to understand that you can shift the investor's mindset, but for us, for that, you have to ask the right questions. One of the biggest problems we get is that you, you assume the investor knows what they want. Uh, uh, and many times they do know what they want, but they don't know what they need. So, so, so it, it, what they want is, is, is because of the wrong fundamentals because they have a wrong perception of what, of what, what they think they want is going to accomplish them as far as an investment. So asking the right questions is one of the key points. And that's why, you know, you have to understand there's different types of investors and we've spoken about all of these and these different types of investments go, you have to align them also depending on the different questions you're going to ask to these people. So, so, so these investors and, and you're, you're becoming an advisor and a consultant, not an order taker because you cannot just take orders on the investment side without trying to understand the purpose, the purpose and the realities that they want to achieve. When you're investing, you're looking for something else in the future that's going to bring you a return. If not, you're buying something that for the purpose of investment, you're buying for something else. Um, so in real estate, a lot of people get, you don't buy a stock to live in the stock. So that's why normally when you're buying stocks, it has just the purpose of making you money. Um, it, when you're buying real estate, it, sometimes people are crowded because of that. So we're not going to get into many on the different yeah, types of assets, just so you guys see them one more time. And, 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 I, go and I need to add to, to what you said, Andres, uh, you know, we, we deal with a lot of you, either whether it be in the call center or it be, you know, asking Andres, myself, uh, or your, your leaders, oh, I have an investor, I'm looking for this. And, 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 and you kind of, when I stop and I, and I really try to, to, to go a little bit deeper than that, I feel a lot of us in the real estate game are, are order takers. And that's where we fail a lot, Andres. I think that's an important point to bring to light. Stop mm -hmm. being the order taker. Take the time to gather intelligence. That, get to the why. Ask why and what if. 
And what if not? And what, why this? And why haven't you talked about the, the stock market? Why don't you leave your money in this place that you have it? I, I think when you start digging in, Andres, you really can help identify where, where that investor can be taken. And that is the most critical part because it cuts a lot of these investors that talk a lot of crap which exist and you know, you and I have ran into that a million times. They're just not serious. They're just wasting your time. Everybody dreams to have a real estate empire, everybody. I don't think I've met one person that tells me I don't want this. And that being said, if everybody wants it, we gotta make sure that the people we're working for are truly ones that need it, that need it and actually really inspire to do it and have the ability to do it, the, the, the capability of doing it. And I think that those, those takes, take away at home uh, that you were saying, Andres, are very important for them to understand very well. Get your scripts from investors that we've created for you. Ask the right questions. Andres, on the next slide, I think you have some of the questions as well, yeah. right? Yeah. That we can break down. And it all comes down to don't just take the order, dig in. Put that passion into finding out and letting them feel I need to find this out because I can passionately get you to where you need to get to if we understand that right. Yeah, after doing this for a long time, Enrique, I think we've seen like 50% of the time the order you get is not what they, that you end up delivering because at the end of the day, the order you get, it, it, it's always, hey, I want a multifamily. Hey, can you get me a commercial building? Hey, I want to have an Airbnb. And until you ask why and start digging in through the rest of the questions, the investors usually don't come to you and say, hey, I'm looking for a 6 7% return. And I want to then be able to leverage a little bit of this money and I want to have a 10 year horizon and there I'm going to have to, I want to have this annualized return and something that's safe and then something that I could do this with and then build it up. They come to you and say, hi, please buy me a condo in Brickle. Why? You know, and then you, and then you start digging. So expectations is also very important because the expectations uh, are the only thing that are going to make something better again or worse. So if somebody has very high expectations and unrealistic expectations, doesn't matter how good you make real estate an investment from what it can do for you. If you did not manage the expectations yeah. correctly, you're going to always fail to that investor. And that, that's also very important. No, that, 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 that's huge. And, and another one I'll put in there too, to put in perspective as we get into the questions is the one that, uh, you know, just like when you get your first listing, uh, and, and we, I probably share this with everybody out there. When I forgot my first listing, you're all excited, you get it. And what ended up happening is, that, yeah, if I got the seller the price that he wanted, which was a, a dream, you know, a dream in the air, I would have sold the listing. But I just got the listing and I was all excited. Same thing happens when we deal with our, with our buyers. Same thing happens when we deal with an investor. We think, oh my God, this person has a lot of money. They're very serious. They're going to buy from me. Let me get moving. And, and, and these are the things where you gotta, you got to get that excitement and that energy and control it. Take a deep breath and say, wait, wait, I'm the expert. It's like the doctor. The doctor's not going to do open heart surgery on you without doing a series of tests. And that is the questions you guys are seeing here before you on your side to be able to grab the perception because what we're doing with questions is understanding the other person's perception of the world. And once we understand their perception, then we can help really land the reality because we understand as professionals, our markets, the investments, what we provide. And that is the key here. And some of these questions that we came up with here are, are within your, your Avanti Way scripts for those of you in our Avanti Way. I know we have uh, uh, some agents from the outside as well. Uh, these are key questions to, to go ahead and ask. Go ahead, Andres. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, they're not rocket science. The key is that many agents just jump this part and then they go directly to the, to the looking for properties and finding product. And, and, and then they don't realize why are they failing and failing and why are they not allocating money? And they start looking at all the different realities that are not making them successful that are just myths. The reality is, that they were never qualified right. So, so, and address the expectations for the returns. And then you gave them from the pharmacy what they needed to, to take for their uh, goals, no? So again, I don't, we wanna get this into the numbers more, 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 more than, than, than this part of it. And we're excited and eager to get there, but we, we do you wanna give you this it. first. It yeah, so, so, so I just wanna give you, you know, a, a very quick, you know, eight questions or so, so, so you keep them always in mind that when you're talking to an investor, never uh, fail to ask these type of things, you know? Why are you investing? Uh, and the reason, again, the purpose, what are you trying to accomplish? And then you can follow up with, are you doing it for income? 
Are you doing it for appreciation? Is it a safety net? Is it a tax purpose? What, what is it that you're planning to do? Are you planning to use this property yourself or somebody that, that you know or, or you're going to plan on use it in the future, your kids? Or, or is there any plan on the usage? Because that's a very important piece that's very relevant in real estate that you need to address. Or is it a combination of things? Because if, he's, if the person or the family or the investor at one point is going to use it, then the advice is always going to come first on what are the requirements to use it. And you put your you know, regular buyer hat, whether it's commercial or residential, and then, okay, to address those needs, what are the type of returns and investments and areas that exist? Because you first have to address the needs. Um, one very quick question that we failed to ask many times is where is your money now? That money that you're going to invest has to be somewhere. Where is it? How much is it generating now? Because that's again the comparison because you're only going to want to move it to real estate if it's going to give you either a higher return or any of the other uh, or something similar of a return but with many of the other um, um, uh, positive aspects of the real estate investment, you know, and, and ask them if they're targeting a particular return. And that's, again, expectations, because it depends on the type of return that they're targeting. And you have to ask whether it's a com total return or is it a cash flow you know, type of return that they're looking at when they give you a number. Because if you give me a, we want to make a 20% return, many people just think, oh my God, there's no 20% return cap rating in, in Miami. You're crazy. But wait, I mean, if it's a 20% annualized return after you sell the investment in 10 years, uh, that, that could be done. Uh, depends on the leverage, depends on many things, but we're going to show you with the numbers how that could be done. Uh, is it, are, you, are you planning on doing a passive or active role? That's very, very important to be able to also project because if you're going to actively run your investment and you're going to be the one executing it, you have to make sure that they understand the expectations and what that requires. And obviously, it's going to be less costly as far as commissions, as far as property management fees, asset management fees, and all the other type of things. Or if it's, you know, you're going to be building, if you're going to build it yourself, if you're a handyman, you're going to be the one doing the work or flipping or whatever. Uh, obviously, the numbers are going to be less expense if you don't count what your stress and your hourly rate and all those things uh, uh, amount to and your level of expertise and uh, margin of error or the cost of not doing things right uh, 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 with the investment. M many investors fail to look at that. So those are the things you got to put into perspective and then be able to say, okay, well, is there a team or can we become that team that helps you in the execution? The key in a real estate investment, numbers can be painted very nicely. Uh, and normally with, you know, product that's being offered to you in this market and in real estate, you guys have probably seen it many, many times. Numbers are painted much higher than the reality. They fail to include many costs, mainly in the execution side, commissions, insurance, repairs, um, uh, legal structures, uh, uh, property management and things like that to obviously put up the, the, the numbers and the returns so they look uh, shinier than they really are. So Putting those things into perspective are really, really important so you can then compare, okay, but is this return including these other things that uh, we are doing and what's the cost of you doing it yourself or doing it somewhere else? The returns could be very pretty in paper. Execution is what makes a real estate investment work. And uh, even more so, and that's why sometimes it's such a headache for investors to go into real estate because the execution requires time, effort, headaches, a, a, a lot of pieces, parties that get involved. And, and when you invest in a stock, you just don't know why it's going up or down in, in the main world. And us, you know, in the, in the, that are not into, into, the, into the, you know, uh, uh, Wall Street uh, floor. Uh, uh, but but it, at the end of the day, uh, you have no, no control, real control on what's being done there. But if you're executing the investment yourself, you do have a lot of control. I mean, so if things start going bad, uh, you feel that, or you're not really never knowing that you could have been making better returns if it was managed correctly. So that, that's all that I'm talking about right now is part of that conversation that needs to go through that question of, are you playing an active or passive role? A lot of, it, a lot of people don't look at that. Are you in the long run or short run? Timing is key in a real estate investment. The biggest thing, 
in, in this question is that if you're in a long-term hold strategy, you have a lot more time to make the investment and have much better annualized returns because you can wait for timing if you structure yourself so that your numbers and your ratios that we're going to look at are positive and you can wait. If you're always on a negative side in terms of your cash flow and you're bleeding money with your investment, you're always um, not in a position to really wait for the right time for when you need to sell your investment. And that's a key part of, of, of the structure, no? So long-term, short-term, uh, a lot of the short-term flipping strategies work very, very well, make a, little, a lot of people a lot of money, but they become a lot more risky. So those numbers, uh, when you can play with a little bit more time in your investment, it's usually uh, a, a, a better, more solid investment. Doing an investment in a three-year versus a 10-year in real estate has a lot of a difference, okay? Although you're looking at things on your annualized return, okay? So last, uh, last questions, you know, that, that, that we would recommend you always look into before digging into numbers uh, with your investors is if there is going to be cash, leverage, how are you going to uh, allocate the funds for this investor? Are you open for leverage? Because many times they'll tell you, no, I have cash, but one of the biggest uh, aspects of a real estate investment is if you can leverage right. Now we have amazing uh, interest rates and, and, and we'll see what are the, the determining factors of a good investment and leverage is one of them. So ask about that. Don't take their answer as the reality, uh, but their answer is, okay, what's your appetite? And do you feel, have you ever leveraged an investment? You think you have um, the capability because there's also more risks associated with them. A lot of the investors in Latin America and in South America are not used to in their countries leveraging so much. So that's why there's a, a lot of education that has to go behind this. Leverage could be very risky on many investments and you have to be that advisor that's being able to, to address leverage within any investment to see the risk, how the risk factor of that. Uh, and when the investment is doing well or you have a, a solid cash flow investment, it could be a, a very instrumental in just skyrocketing those numbers. We're going to go into those examples, no? A risk, again, what's your risk tolerance level? That's a, a, a no-brainer. We, we, we need to be able to address that. Who are the decision makers? Important that you're talking to everybody that's part of this. What's your timing to make the investment? That will allow you to obviously understand how much time to structure everything and to start getting them in the right positioning and prioritize on your side. And, and then very important, the legal structure. You know, you're not a legal advisor. You have to have a team that you can advise. We obviously have great partners that, that give great advice on uh, uh, corporate structuring, estate planning, uh, sta tax uh, efficiencies. And the legal structure is something that sometimes takes time to do. If you make a wrong decision on the legal structure of your investor, it could cause you to really fade away most of the returns. We've seen a lot of cases like that, Enrique, no? where, yeah. where we've had to, to you know, step in to try to get them the right advisory with the right partners to, to make sure that you know, 10 years down the line, when they sell, they restructure because the way they were structured before was going to get them to lose basically most of the income they had received. Yeah, no, no. And I, I think, you know, based on the questions that you're asking, to me, the biggest, you know, principle that I try to get at, and it takes time to deliver, uh, you know, to get there, right? It's very rude to just go up to Andres and say, hey, Andres, what is your money doing right now? Right? And, yeah. and that, 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 that's going to make Andres feel very comfortable. And I think part of those conversations as you're having with the investor, you're obviously probing, right? You're, 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 you're giving, you're taking, uh, you know, having these conversations, it's, it's, it's like dancing, right? Like there, there's, there's a tone that goes into this, there's music playing, uh, you're feeding in, you know, and the investor's talking to you. So you give information that makes you sound knowledgeable, that gives you the right to ask the next question. And to me, you know, the ultimate goal is to get to that question. Like, what is your money doing right now, Andres? Because the timing would make a lot of sense to me, right? If Andres tells me my, my money's in a bank CD and I'm making 0.01 and probably not today I'm making negative whatever, you know, and I have an investment that makes 3%, like I, I'm going to create the urgency of time and say, hey, Andres, let's get you into this thing. It's 3%. It's this secure. Here's the volatility. And you start that sales energy 
that executes that. And I think that that reduces time. And I also get asked a lot, Andres, how do you know somebody's really serious? And I always say, listen, whoever's serious to invest in a legal structure is 100% serious to invest because they've already committed to you to work with your legal team or, or whatever, the, the, the attorneys of the actual buyer themselves to put money, open a corporation and structure their next assets. I can promise you this, in 99% of the time, owning a real estate asset under your own name is a very dumb thing to do. There, there, there might be just 1% or less than 1% of the time where there would be a logical reason to do that. And as, as you know, salespeople, we, we're looking for the commission. So if the order is, find me an investment apartment in the homestead area. I'm just running around, I get the apartment. I don't, I don't care about anything. I just put everything together. And then all of a sudden, you know, 10 years later, the person died and the kid's not receiving the investment and they, they lose 50% of their investment. And guys, this, I kid you not, this has, Andres and I have seen this happen within our investment portfolios of investors that came from other realtors that didn't know. And now the family's crying saying, how, why did I lose 50% of my dad's money? No, and they lose, they lose more because they lose 50% of what the investment cost is valued at that point in time, which might be very well over what they even invested. What, what they invested. And it's just, it, it's, it, it's crazy when you really see this, Andres. So one of the biggest things for me, one of my caveats is let's get you legally struck. You want to play the game? Let's get you legally structured right. Because I will let you into this secret, guys, all of you in this room. A good investment flies off the market. But I mean flies because you have hawks like Andres and I with money sitting in the pockets of investors just ready to unload in the market. And we're not the only ones, guys. There's, there's many people like us that think they know what they're doing, that know what they know what they're doing, and they're out there hunting. And I think that that part is where I tell the investor, listen, if you want to play games and just receive properties and see, I'll send you, but for whatever I'm going to send you probably will sell very, very fast. And that's where you find, you know, the commitment of the person to move forward and being realistic is very important. Are there possibilities of making 15, 20, 30% of real estate? Yes, it's very possible. Just like it is in any other uh, of the vehicles to invest in, but is it very probable? And what I try to bring to the investor is let's focus on probabilities, not possibilities. And that's a big thing. It's very probable to put your money in a very safe place right now in real estate between four and 6% return. That's very probable. Let, if, you want, if that's where you want to move towards, then we can make an investment happen. Is it possible to get eight, nine, 10? Yeah, it is possible, but it's not probable. It might take us two years to allocate the money at 10%. And it was much cheaper, Andres, to put the money to work now at five because of what I lost within the gap. But very important, when you're talking of returns, you have to make sure you're, you're talking about the right type of return. Because when Rick is talking about your cash flow and cash and cash and, 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 and cap rate out of four to six, but at the end of the day, the total ROI of that investment, if, if people want, sometimes when they tell you, I want a 12% or 15% return. That's a good point. It, as a total return annualized, you will get it most likely even in those four to 6% returns on a cash on cash. So very important to drive home. What type of return are we talking about? No? So, yep. so, so again, we're seeing some questions about the legal structure part. We have uh, great partners uh, within the organization, ASI Financial. Uh, they, they have all that type of structuring. We're having the inside in-house in attorneys and, and people do very good corporate structuring for your, your consumers and yourselves. So, so yes, we will, we will get you guys that information. We'll put it up here so you guys can start you know, consulting with them. It's always a great area. There's no black and white yeah. answers. Uh, there's no the only, one size the fits answer, all. The only answer I can guarantee you is that 99.9% no .9 of the cases need a legal structure. What, what that legal structure is, it's more on a case-by-case -case basis, but having a legal structure as simple as putting companies together to limit liabilities all the way down to setting up an offshore structure or an insurance policy that can protect you if you die to pay the inheritance taxes. Those are the things that you're looking for. Now, we're not experts, right? We can't give a legal opinion. Now, we can say is, listen, you, you should have the legal structure. Let's go find out which one works for you. And here's some of the reasons why you would want to think about that way, right? 
And it's that, if you die, there's inheritance tax. If you're not structured correctly, you end up selling the property and you end up paying more in taxes between Fripta and all these things. Just it simply was set up right correctly. It's very easy in the United States to bring your money. The United States loves people, people bringing money in here. So it's easy to put your money in this country as opposed to other countries where you have to have legal structure set up. Here, they don't care, bring the money in. The biggest hurdle you have in doing that is taking your money back out. And that's where the biggest problems lie here. And that's where they love to tax you because they, the United States does not have a short-term vision tax system. We have a very long-term vision. We wanna, make, we wanna charge you when you made the most amount of money in your investment, when you've capitalized on your investment. But in between there, we wanna give you wings to fly with no excuses for making your money. And I think yeah. that that's the biggest takeaway that I would always tell you, land the investor to understand that point. Yeah. All right. So, so let's talk about what are the key success variables um, in any investment in real estate. So now we're going to start digging from the high up, upper level to, to some of the, the basics of this. So, so again, an investment to be successful, okay, and, and in all areas in real estate, the, the high level part, if, if you want to dive, dive it home, is first to have the net operating income and cash flow part of the investment. Okay, am I generating income month to month, year to year uh, with the cash that's being generated by the rental? Okay, or if it's a short term, uh, say um, a, a short term investment on a flip, then income is not something that forget. That's why you're putting that much weight on, but you're trying to just 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 push the the appreciation, which is the second one. Now, the second variable in general for all real estate assets. It's the appreciation component, which is how good did you buy? How good did you sell? What's the property purchase value when you bought it? And what was the purchase value when you sold? That is the second piece of a real estate investment. So you have the net operating income of the property, which is linked to the cash flow. Not exactly the same because you have the last piece, which is what is the equity that you invested in compare? And did you leverage that? Did you use other people's money or is it all your money and that is if you combine these three elements in whatever ratios that we're going to be discussing these are the three high level things that you should be looking into so we're bringing it to the most simplistic uh equation which is cash flow or income appreciation of your asset over time uh and uh, equity invested versus the leverage that you put in those three things together will give you a complete a return of your investment uh, and, and that's kind of the basis we talk of, about of what this is return like andrea said very important there's there's different components right i was talking about cash on cash there's the whole picture and when you get up to the to the slides at the top where we were talking about return and volatility right the real estate return of 8.45 percent is considering or 8.55 percent is considered including everything you see here right and again this is where if you pick the right company in the right group, like Andres and I, our return on, on re investments on, on an average are about 12.5 to 13% on an average. And granted, that's the difference between picking somebody that's average and obviously picking people that know what they're doing and dig into the numbers and, and have an experience and have why a product line works. And, and, and to me, I'm not working with an investor because I need to do a service for them. I'm working with the investors because I'm going to add value to them. And that's very important to understand that those are the caveats that make investments perform uh, better than the, the markets uh, out yeah. there. So we're going to start digging into how do you really uh, understand the numbers, the net operating income, the cash flow, the appreciation, the purchase, so the equity, the leverage. If you look at this, uh, the, 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 the names in the, in the screen right now, this is the foundation and the basics. Now, how do you really look at the different ratios, metrics, and variables that, that put numbers into the combination of formulas that you can put together using all these elements uh, when you're looking at an investment and we're gonna take you through it so you can become very savvy on how to talk the lingo, how to address numbers, and what could be you know, expected in the different types of scenarios. But again, as an investor, if you don't go through all the first part that we went through as an advisor, then you might be looking at this on a one size fits all where the investment investor might be looking at this 
more one of these parts of the equation is more valuable for their purpose or less valuable for their purpose but no matter what the purpose is this is the real variable these are the real variables that make are key the key success factor for any investment in real estate okay so another part that's important before we look into the numbers so the two things that we want to put you guys in perspective is the variables that we're going to be looking into in a combination of ratios and, and elements and numbers and we want to mix that up with something that's very important which is how do you value a property because appreciation is something very important and how a property trades in the market is something very important when you're looking at numbers and that's again uh, how do we trade properties it's because of a comparison how much are other properties trading in the same uh, type of asset or environment or market that you're in you're all very, very um, accustomed to the comparable approach, which is the first one that we're looking at here. And, and that's the, the, the one that we use on the regular buying side, where you're just comparing property values of how much was the price per square footage of the house that sold next to it, that has just some criteria. And we're looking at different elements for comparison. And Rikim did a great, great webinar uh, in, in Zoom meeting a, a couple of weeks ago, I think last week, on, on pricing properties and understanding uh, comparables, and it was mainly focused on this comparable approach. Yeah, now, that's the most common one. It's, it's used by the uh, appraisal industry. It's, it's very, very, very common uh, out there. And, and, and I think a very common mistake, Andres, is that people actually use this to, to compare the investment. Which correct. Is, which is mind blowing, you know, but, but, but yes, it's a very common one, you know, just used incorrectly. Just correctly, but it's a very, very typical uh, mistake. And, and, and again, we want to be able to explain to the investor and to, to obviously the people that, that, that you're talking to advising that this, yeah, they're, they're used to this approach, but that, uh, the investment will compare to this approach. There's the replacement cost approach. I don't know if you want to mention this, uh, talk about this yeah. I think a little bit, but basically, yeah, when, you, when you're comparing against what does it cost you to build this house versus, versus you know, buy something that's there or, or so, insurance so is, take that too, a lot into this account. This is used a lot by insurance companies. Uh, you know, um, it, usually in your appraisal, it's there. It, it, it's usually done every time. Um, and it's, it's basically this. It's a very simple calculation. How much would it cost me to buy a piece of land right? And build that same similar house. And, and when comparables become extremely difficult, like when you get to rural areas, Andres, like farm, you know, uh, the redlands and, and very rural areas where there's not the same types of comparables, um, you know, what, what starts happening is you use the replacement cost approach to figure this out. And, and I believe, Andres, you and I were running a, across a case uh, of, of an investor or a person that wanted to buy their own home and it was being built. And then I think you worked out working the whole math backwards, right? How much does a piece of land cost? What is it going to cost to build this much for price per square foot? What are the costs? And then from there, you'll determine this is the cost. It's always going to be cheaper than anybody asking for it, but then you have to build in what's called the headache. Like, okay, wait, I'm going to deal with all these people for a year and take all this time where they can rob my money. I have all these risk factors. Hey, listen, I'd rather pay $150,000 to have this done for me and I'll pay you for that money because it's cheap for me. And, and that's not, get a, not, not, get a, not get a divorce, you know, along the way. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that side. So, so very, very important one, you know, to know of that it exists. And then the, the last one, which is rarely used, but mostly used by banks, is the income capitalization approach. And this is the key to investing because all we're doing here is saying, okay, Similar type of property, what type of income does this give me? What percentage of return does this have versus this one? And income capitalization is just based on the cash flows of the property. They don't, they don't extend into the appreciation of the property factor. It's, it's more looked at on, on a cash flow basis or, or more than cash flow to get this straight. It's looked at on a cap rate basis, uh, which, which is what's out there. Yeah, it's basically at the, the net operating income uh, side of it. And, and, and this part of the equation takes out the debt part of it because you might be leveraging on different scenarios. Leverage might be different from one investor to the other. So the same way that in a property where uh, in, the, in the comparable approach, you're looking at taxes to make it very 
very understandable for you guys. Uh, when you're looking at taxes for a regular property and, and you, you try to use the taxes of the person that owns the property, the seller, the taxes are going to be different when you uh, buy the property. You're going to have a very different situation on your taxes. That's why you use a percentage for taxes and you don't care what the old owner used to pay for taxes. The same way in the income capitalization approach, just to make it easy to understand, you have to take aside the debt or the leverage because the new investor will not uh, get the, new, the, the same leverage that you have, not, not the same conditions and, and anything else. So you want to compare apples with apples. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, so, so having said that, I think now we gave you kind of, a, I think Enrique, we gave a, a good perspective on the high level area of, of all the elements that we're going to be looking into in terms of numbers. It's going to be based on income capitalization approach. It's the only way to understand investments. Uh, it's going to be based on these different elements. Uh, and now how do we put all these variables together using the income capitalization approach to give you the linguistics and, and understand the property? What we thought, on how to, how to really deliver this the easiest to you guys is to run the most basic investment so we don't make it complicated on just a regular middle class uh, property and just understand that whatever we're going to show you now, it just is the same for any other type of, you know, real estate investment. It's just that uh, you might have you know, more, more rentals within the same building. You might have different types of expenses that go in in different scenarios. Uh, or, or the numbers might be larger as a whole, uh, but at the end of the day, it takes into account all the same metrics. So we're gonna go in and, 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 and go and understand the investment report. I think uh, we were talking and I, Enrique and I, and, I, and I, and how to really deliver this the best. And, and we thought about you know, using the, the AVEX anti-way investment report that our system generates automatically to be able, so you guys can really learn how to explain it. And as you know how to explain that report, you will understand the matrix and it will give you actionable advice on, on how to take an investor through a report like that and bring perspective into the numbers. Make sense? So, 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 so let, let's go into, into it. And, 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 and um, uh, this is the, 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 what the report provides to you on a cash for a single property. I think you're being too modest, Andres. This is the Picasso you guys get from Avanti Way that gives you all the details to get every single investment deal done. And, right. you know, this is, this is it. This is, the, this is the magic behind the scenes that we're able to deliver seamless to the investor a great, uh, you know, a great detailed piece of information that, that covers everything. And I, you know, what we want to teach for our own agents, obviously that are upgrading and getting into the investor game. And for those agents that are joining us from the outside is the ability to break down these data points in a very logical way that gives you the ability to sound like a pro because you understand these numbers and what they need to, to give you back. So you go through it because I've seen, you know, even our own agents and agents from the outside that are pitching me investment where, where they don't understand this. And as they're telling you, oh, this is a cap rate of this. And it's like, okay, how do you calculate a cap rate? I don't know. This is what it says here. And you're like, oh, wait, you have to understand the science behind it. You have to understand cap rates can be BS. Most of the cap rates that people give you out there are put in a way where they make them very high because obviously the seller wants to make his property look great. And as an investor professional, you need to know this. And the idea what we're going to go through right now is the breakdown of all the major ratios and this will do a quick overview. What do they mean? What are they supposed to look like? And what are good or bad ratios to understand to deliver that? Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll take it by steps. And I'm going to annotate some things here to make it easier for you guys to see it. This top area over here is where we're going to be able to see the main metrics that's, that many times the investor is looking for. They wanna, you want to know how much money in total you invested. This is for a property that has an acquisition price of $150,000, but you need to remember that it, you always have capital improvements that you're going to add to that investment, which in this case were two, uh, $2,500, then that, that increases the property value, and then you have closing costs that go above this. So forget about the specific numbers that we're, we're looking at here. Uh, this, is a very, this is a real investment, but, but you can take this as large or as 
uh, um, little as, as you want, depending on the investment. It's the same exact variable, same exact report. So when you add these up, you're going to get the one, the 155, uh, 50 that you get here. So that's how much is your total investment. Now we're going to look afterwards of how, what happens to a property like this when you have this type of investment and you leverage, you don't invest the full amount, but you have somebody else investing for you. That changes the numbers a bit as well. Um, that's, the, that's the beautiful part of real estate, right? And there's that, that yes. you're able to leverage that. So you're able to get a bigger investment. When you go buy stocks and bonds, a bank doesn't say, oh, well, if you're going to buy $100,000 worth of stock, you can put $50,000 down. I mean, you might, you might hear of a scenario that's very rare, but that's not the way that traditionally transacts. In real estate, right. that's the way it works. Put 20% down, add collateral of a property, and, and, you take, and you get it going. Yeah, remember, in real estate, you're always talking about price per square foot uh, and many aspects. Uh, and you want to look at cost per square foot, and some of the ratios will look at that. Uh, and, and, and a, a lot of investments want to compare apples with apples in many ways. The comparison approach makes, makes it more per square footage. The capitalization approach takes less into account square footage, but it keeps on being an important element to always understand because once you bring things to square footage, even in the commercial end, uh, you, you're, you're able to understand a comparisons alongside of how much rentable square footage there is in one property versus the other. So that, that allows you to, to sometimes understand that assets might have, you know, 20, uh, what things are trading on when they are 20,000 square foot buildings versus 10,000 square foot buildings or in an apartment like this, whether, you know, things that are lower than a thousand dollars a foot at that a thousand a square foot trade differently than things that are two or three thousand dollars a foot so that's why the per foot denomination keeps on becoming relevant in this type of approach you have the cash flow whether it's monthly or yearly which we're going to look at the cash flow yearly as well uh, it is one of the most if not the, the most important metric that you're going to be understanding in many ways because the cash flow makes the investment be positive creates the cash on cash return that you can compare with other situations and puts you in a position of, uh, if you have a good cash flow, the ability to wait, out, to wait out any situations, including what's happening now in COVID, for example. If you have a healthy cash flow, you navigate through situations like COVID in a much better uh, scenario. To have a healthy cash flow, you need to have good leverage, good financing in place, because if not, that eats up to your cash flow. We're going to talk a lot about that, but that's one of the main variables as well. Then I'm going to leave out for a second the expense ratio. We're yeah, going to go into the me, ratios later. Let, let me, yeah, let me, let me jump in there. One of, one of the tricks that you try to do over time and, and as you become an expert is, is finding the, the common denominator, right? And the price per square foot that Andres talks about is one of those abilities to find that common denominator it makes it simple right because if andres talks to me about a condo in kendall and I, you know i just ask a simple question what's the price per square foot if i know things are selling for 120 or 140 or 128 or whatever and andres tells me hey look this one's for 110 it's gonna it's gonna intrigue me right but if andres just came up to me and says hey this apartment's worth 200 but i normally am paying 140 for an apartment but i didn't ask the square foot question I didn't know it was much bigger his, and I would have probably just ignored it. So as you start working with this common denominators of, for example, for every $100,000 that you invest, how much money is the investor coming out with? Like the next one that Andres has the cash flow. So if we did 155,000, we make $763 a month, or yeah, a month, sorry. What type of return is that? What relationship does that have to the number? And that has, off the bat, a 0.5%, you know, relationship of the number. And it's these common denominators, guys, that, is gonna, that, that are going to help you look at the market on a completely different level and be able to, I mean, I'm talking about look at multiple deals in seconds and understand and decipher whether they're good or bad very quickly by looking at these pulses and these common denominators that we're going to teach you. And what's key here is that each investor also looks at these things differently. So you have to, once you present this, 
remember that, the, the, for example, the cash flow, a lot of investors are really going to want to see this number. So, so tell me, okay, I don't care about anything else. Just tell me how much money am I going to be left at every month? And I want to be able to take this money to, let's say, Venezuela to pay my life there. So I just want to make sure at least I'm making 500 bucks that I can take out every month. And then everything else is fine. As long as I can do that, I'm going to be okay. So finding out what each of these metrics and denominators are going to resonate with each of the investors are going to be key. So not only are you going to use these metrics to find the denominators, as Enrique says, and to find where the deals are and be able to, which is very important as you're looking for deals, to be able to bring a pool of deals down to a way to filter them until you get a less and less options to really dig further. So they, they really will work. Some of the metrics we're gonna give you today will give you rule of thumb to try to be able to take away some you know, investments and focus on possible investments and focus on the opportunities of where to dig further to find the deals. You need a process for that. And for that, these, these are going to be very useful. So uh, we're going to focus first on three or four main ones. And then we're going to dig in through the ratios. So on the main ones, you have, obviously, you got to understand the total money you're investing. You have the price per square foot. You have the cash flow on a monthly and a yearly basis. And we're going to see how, how, you, you, how you, you get to that. Um, uh, the expense ratio I'm going to leave for later so we can look at all the ratios uh, together. But I do want to focus on what's cash on cash, you know, cap rate, okay, and ROI and IRR, okay? And why do I want to do that? It's because it's the high level part of any investment. Once we understand those as returns, then we can dig in on how to use some of the other ratios. Enrique, you think it's a good idea? We go through those four very well. And yeah. then how, how, how do we get to those? And then we dig, we dig yeah, yeah, further, then, no? Then, then we'll dig in and land on, on all, the, all the variables, yeah. Yes. So, so before we even go into these, the only thing I want to make sure we, we understand from the report is we looked at the acquisition part. The loan part, in this case, to make it simple for you to understand, we're going to make it cash first, and then we're going to add leverage. Whenever you add leverage, all these numbers are going to come into play. But right now, we're going to leave that aside. Okay, and we have to understand income. So what, why is this property making money at all? <laughs> the, the, the basic foundation of this is because it has one rent of two bedrooms. It's one unit that's being rented that's producing $20,000 a year. And that is $1,700 per month. That's the rent, whatever it is. If it's gonna be a multifamily, it's gonna be X amount of rentals that's going to get you to that number. If it's gonna be a office building, a retail center, an industrial, it's always going to be a tenant that's going to bring you this money. So this is what the gross schedule annual income will be without vacancy. So this is what's going to bring the income, but you have to understand there is always vacancy. So to understand the rest of the numbers, we gotta just take very quickly and say, okay, What's the profit and loss like any other business of a real estate investment? You're going to have your income, which in this case is 1,700 times 12, which is $20,000 for hundred. That's the max that this property will generate. But is it really generating that? Let's add a vacancy rate of annually 7% in this case, okay? And so as we add that up, because you have some years that you rent it in a, you only have half a month vacancy. You have some years in which you'll have two months vacancy. You have some years you have one, and then you have a renter that might be there three years. So as you're looking at a five-year period, a five-year horizon, let's say a 7% a vacancy rate. We recommend if you want to be conservative, anywhere between a six and an 8% a, a vacancy rate. But again, you need to know the benchmarks in your market to be able to assess that well. If you're dealing with commercial, and any other things, you have to look at what the data gives you. What's the trend? What are the vacancies in this area? And there are many softwares and products and, 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 and situations. And we, we do a lot of running of those numbers that give you what that vacancy rate is in average in those areas. And that's the one that you should put there. Okay. So I don't want you to just put a number just to put it. But if you don't know what to put, you know, six to 8% might be reasonable. Correct, Enrique? You're in the same page with me? If you're in a very high rental area, you might be able to work with a four or five, no? 
exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that, that's that. And then that, that gives you what's called the gross income. Because we, before we go into the ratios, we got to understand what each of the main elements are here. Uh, what's the gross income? It's just going to be this minus this. It gives you this. So what you were supposed to rent for minus the income you did not get because of vacancy gives you the actual effective, not scheduled, but effective gross income on a property. In this case, it's a little bit less than $19,000. The numbers that you're going to calculate are based on this effective gross income. It is not based on the gross annual because you're not really getting that. This is what you're really getting. Okay. Now, obviously execution is very important to try to get the highest number here because that's going to determine a lot of the success for the business. It was one of those three elements that we put up in the beginning. Now you have operating expenses because you do have expenses. So when you add up all the expenses, okay, and we're not going to go in here and try to, you know, trickle down every single expense because it's different every time. But we have to do a, a somebody there is speaking. I don't know if you guys want to mute it. Uh, Adriana. There you go. All right. So uh, you have operating expenses. When you add all your operating expenses, one of the other very key numbers, that would be every single expense that you attach to the property to operate it. For example, you have the condo association. you have the management uh, um, uh, the taxes of the property all of those are you know part of the operating expenses you're going to leave out okay the debt any expense from the debt once you do that okay in this case there's no debt anyway you get to the subtraction of these two which it is 18,000 in this case of gross income minus operating expenses of nearly $9,000 give you one of the most important numbers in every real estate investment, which is the NOI. Have you guys ever heard of NOI? NOI is net operating income. That is what's going to be based off your cap rate. That is what in every investor you will be able to compare apples with apples with. So this number over here in this report is one of the most important numbers that you have. Okay. And, and, and that, that, that's kind of the first part that I want to bring to light before we go into, into the, the ratios. Once you know this number, okay, you are in a really good position to start calculating the ratios with everything that we did. Now we already have enough of the numbers that will get us to calculate uh, the ratios. And that's how we're going to then do a, an equation to try to see how much this property could be trading at, or how much is the, the, the um, a value of this property. Anything you want to bring up to date here, Enrique, before we go into the, into the next part of it? No, no, I thought the explanation was great. Okay, the investment projection, the only thing that we'll take into account, remember we had seen two things. We had seen what's the net operating income, we needed to get the cash, and then we need to know what the appreciation, what happens in the investment over time in five years. So when you, when you say an investment has X percent of annual growth, okay, the problem here is that how do you really know that it's going to be annual growth? Because this, that this is going to be the annual growth. This you can calculate, and that's why this is so key to use as a number for the valuation, because this is something that's real. This you can really project very, very close to the reality if you can execute the property right. This number is the one that many times is just a, 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 an expectation or a myth or what you, know, you would love to see your investment go up to. So when you use the income capitalization approach, you're going to see how we're going to eliminate the you know, annual growth and we're going to try to come up with how much this property should be trading at based on what we call the cap rate, okay? And for that, I think, Enrique, Enrique we can go to the next slide and, and, and no, explain no, no. the right cap rate. No, 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 I'll get to the details. And I think one of the things that's very important is that, um, 
hardcore investor markets, like commercial market, retail market, industrial markets, work much stronger on income capitalization approach because they're buying the income streams. Those properties tend to have much less appreciation. Now, on the when you get into the residential market, in residential, usually I'm speaking about single units, and I would go up to duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, but as you get bigger along the side of it, you tend to have much less appreciation in those markets. So when you buy, like, let's say a multifamily, your appreciation might be much less, but what starts appreciating is the amount of rental over the years, right? So if you have an increment of 3% increases on your leases, it's safe to say that in five years, my investment will go up by 3%. Because and this will go up. Exactly. So, so, so that, that starts going up and that's the main leader in, in these uh, investments. And in real estate, the, the, when you get to the single family part of it, the beautiful part about the investment is that you have good income and you have large appreciation. And the reason you have large appreciation is because you have much more of an emotional buyer. You see, as a consumer, for me to pay $20,000, $30,000 more on a mortgage, I might be paying $30, $50 more a month. And that's not a big deal. But for Andres, the investor, him paying $30,000 more brought a 6% investment down to a 3% investment. And Andres will say, you know what? I'm out. This doesn't work for me. And, and it's very important to understand the dynamics of the, of the types of markets and the benefits of each asset class, right? Yeah, correct. And, 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 and then th th let's drive this home before we go to the next slide, actually, to, to bring it home right, because it's the following. Once you have this, Enrique was talking about the cash on cash return before, and we're going to go dig deep it, but what the cash on cash return is here is 5.91, close to 6%. And that's the percentage that Enrique was talking to you about that a lot of people are wanting to get. What's my cash on cash? And that is the completely income stream of $9,000 divided what I paid for the investors, for the investment. So what was my income, my, my equity and all the, the investment that I did was this amount. So if you divide this amount times uh, divided by this amount, you're going to get the 6%. So you, you'll say, okay, I have a 6% investment. Now, when you're selling this, is it really a 6% investment or is it at almost 11% investment uh, uh, on what you call the ROI when you're, and that's annual. So you, you, it's, it's two different numbers. One thing is this and one thing is this. This does not include any appreciation nor what Enrique is saying that you're going to eventually investment to an emotional buyer. And this does include the appreciation, whether it is in commercial, residential, this includes the appreciation, okay? And this does not. That's very important to, to see that difference. Now, how do you get to this number here? It's just whatever you're being able to sell at, and we're gonna get to how do you get to this number, which in this case, is just a 6% annual return. And these type of properties, you get to it because you're buying to the emotional buyer. So you're, you're using a different equation in this type of investment, but less, the outstanding mortgage, which is a cash deal, less any closing cost, which at around seven to eight percent, because you have to pay the realtor plus the attorneys plus the deed plus the the the, the recordings and and all the selling costs. So here, let's say you have like a seven point five percent return uh, cost here, which is fifteen thousand, gives you a net proceeds. This is how much you're left off of one eighty five, less how much. You invested, which is 155, gets you that you made $30,000 as far as what your investment grew. This is how much you made in the difference from what you purchased and what you sold. This is what we're left in your pocket after all your costs, plus the fact that your cash flow went up and uh, you increased in cash flow every uh, in the five years. $51,000 came into your pocket with cash flow that earns you the total of 82,000 and 82,000 divided by the amount that you invested. Okay. That's going to be your 53% return on your total return of your investment. When you divide it by the five years, it's the 1061 a year.
So that's a very straight line of how you get adding the growth of your investment and your cash flow to your total return and you just put it in a percentage against what, how much money you invested. That's kind of the basics. So now okay. you've got to the two main numbers of an investment, which is cash on cash and your ROI. And then we'll talk about some variations of that, which is the cap rate and the IRR. Make sense? Andre, Andrea, you think it flew through? You're making me want to buy this investment. Where is it? Do we have it? <laughs> I, I spoke and nobody heard me. No, I, I heard you, Andres. Now you're on mute. But you heard me before? Yeah, I heard you perfect. What I was telling you, Andres, is that you're making me want to buy this property. I'm going to buy it. Yeah. Are these, are these, uh, is this a, a new property you found? You there? You, you see me now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you, you, I, I always, uh, it hurt you. It, okay, cool. So yeah, so let, let's break down the numbers. What I was asking you, is this a new property that you found or is this a... No, this is an example of one that we, we purchased for an investor uh, this past year. Okay, so it's not too long ago. Yeah, not too long ago. This was last year. So yeah, let, let's get into the ratios because I think this is that common denominator and this is what's going to give you guys the power and ability to really break down investments very quickly. Yeah, and, and again, the, the, what we're going to go over now, it's going to give you an idea of what these ratios are, including this very well on how to understand it and compare with each other. And these ratios, which are the cap rate and all, all these other ratios down here. So just so you know, what we're going to go through now is how to explain these ratios that are very, very important in addition to obviously the cash on cash and the ROI. All right. Just so you know where we're heading. Okay, let's do this. Go for Enrique. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you take 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 it on if you, if you want, and I'll I'll bet you and I'll, I'll I'll flip it around so you take on the ratio part and I um uh, right. I, I, I jump in. Control, no, uh, for your computer. Yeah. All right, guys. So ratios. Let's let's get into the cap rate. No, which is a very important calculation. Very it done wrong in the industry in terms of manipulation. Um, often calculates as a ratio between the net operating income produced and a, hold on, let me see if I can go back here. Okay. A, it's considered your net operating income, right? So what is your net FY? It's all your income and expenses, okay? Minus the debt that does not include in debt, so no interest rate, no principal payment to the bank. It's your NOI divided by the actual purchase price of the property, okay? That's the first one here that you have. And this is the one that you'll find in most of the, of the flyers. This could be a noise. Give me a, give me a second. Yeah, I know. The noise is my, is my part. I'm, I'm going to try to put my... Okay. So um, typically used in all the flyers, this is the number that you guys will see out there as a common number. And what it basically is, purchase price versus my net income. I'll give you a couple of tricks. How do I figure out net income? And I'm going to break it down a little bit uh, later on. Is usually, how much is this rent for? It rents for $1,000 a month or it rents for $10,000 a month. Okay, perfect. That's $120,000 a year. I usually say 50% are my expenses. I'm left with 50000 what is my cap rate? And I can figure that out in my head very easily. And you'll understand why I use the ratios that I use, okay? Now, moving on through, um, you have your cash on cash, right? One something, Enrique, can I mention something about the cap rate? Yeah. yeah. The, the cap rate is the one that you'll hear the most out there because, again, it takes out that service, which cash on cash, as you'll see here, does not. Right. And that's the way, the reason... Cap rates are used mainly to compare assets, uh, it, it, although it's not the reality of how much you're really making in cash, which is more relevant many times for the investor. Cash on cash is more relevant to the investor, but cap rate, it's, it's relevant to put the price on a property because if you know a cap rate, you'll know how much that area is trading as far as the cap rate. If, if the commercial class B buildings, whatever, in um, Miami Dade or Doral are trading at a six cap rate, then you know if your NOI is X, how much 
if you want to divide that again, if you want to get a price for that building, you divide that against the, the tradable cap rate and you get a price. So for example, in this particular property that we were looking at, if you want to get the price based on the cap rate, if the cap rate was, let's say, you know, how much it was, I don't know, it's there, but let's say 6%, you got to divide and, and, and then you say, listen, this is giving me a 6% cap rate. You're going to say, okay, how much is it trading in this area? And if this area is trading at, let's say 7% and not six, you're going to say, okay, $9,000 divided by 7%, how much does it give me? Exactly. Somebody can make that quick calculation. 9,000 divided by 7%. How much is that? Divided by, I'll do it for you right now. Divided by uh, 0 0.07, it's 128,000. That's what you would pay. So that, that's what you would pay. So it would be trading at that amount. Does it make yeah. sense? And, and that, another that, way to do it is, is, is if you know, for example, if you know that it's a seven cap, right? you know that annually your net income would have to be 7,000 at 7%. So for every hundred grand that I'm going to invest, I'm looking, if that area gives seven, I'm looking for $7,000 net return, which would mean I would be making $14,000 a year, minus my expenses more or less, I'm gonna be uh, you know, around that number there. So the cash on cash, I want you to think of it this way. And for those of you that studied accounting, think about what is the P&L, and then this is the actual cash flow report, right? which is two different reports because this is now every type of movement that's there. There's debt service. This is the, 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 the cash flow. Now, cash on cash to me is the real number I look at because then I'm able to tweak the incomes and expenses to what my cash flow is going to be because I might be getting a loan. I might not have good credit and I have to get a, a, a more expensive loan than the old owner or whatever my situation is. I can now draw what my cash on cash is. And to me, that is the best representative number. And in good investments, if you're buying in cash, cap rate and cash on cash are more or less going to be the same amount. They're, they're, they're gonna be very, very, very in tune aligned with each other. But when you're investing, all of a sudden your cap rate can be seven, but my cash on cash is 11%. Why? Because I put much more or less money into the deal than you would have buying in cash. And it's making me a good amount of cash that puts me in a cash on cash position. That's very good. Yeah, yeah. When you're leveraging, when you're number. leveraging becomes a huge difference. Yeah. This is the most powerful number in the investment, but usually you have to attract me with a, with a cap rate. The, the math has to make sense. And then I'll give you some other ratios that then I'll take the time to find out what my cash on cash is. I won't do that on every investment because it's not worth me getting down to detail unless, unless it's attracting me. Uh, to that point. And, that, and that's very important for you guys to understand. So the next one is the internal rate of, of return. This is a more complex one, right? And this, this basically takes into account your, your cash on cash. What, what return have you gotten on your money? Uh, over time, your cash flow, right? Plus the appreciation of the sale minus what you actually invested into the sale divided by the, the, the cost of the investment. By, by, by the, yeah, actual the, the, the reason why we put both here together, you have the ROI on the right side and the IRR on the left side. So with the formula you're seeing, just to so understand the slide, is the ROI. And then the IRR is on the left side, which we're gonna explain in the next sheet, how it really trickles down. And I want Enrique to explain the difference between these two, because this is one of the things that confuses a lot of the people. ROI is what we saw, which is the gain on the investment, including appreciation and by cash flow, minus the cost of your investment, divided by the cost of your investment and, and the years. Okay, but here the IRR uh, is the, the, the one that, that takes into account the way to compare with other investment assets. No? The, so the IRR ends that. up being the most precision one and it, and it basically is your cash flow over time, right? It's cash flow plus appreciation. So what did you invest on year one? How much? $1,000 came in year two, $2,000 came in year two, $3,000 came in year three, et cetera, et cetera. Over a five year period, it's grabbing the cash flow it's understanding how much you invested and then what was your gain on the sale. And bringing all that back in time, it's called, the, it discounts the time value of money, which is the most important factor. So it gives you a very, very, very precise equation. The ROI is more of a, is more of a if you would ask me an informal way of looking at an investment, a much simpler 
math. Hey, I put this much money in, I got this much out. So I made, you know, 120% in five years. I divide that by five years and now I made whatever, 20% a year, whatever, whatever it would give you, 22%, right? It's, it's a much more off the cuff number. It's used hand on hand in real estate, but it's never the right one to use. <laughs> At the end of the day, you have to fall back into an actual IRR and IRRs are a bit more complex um, to actually calculate because they're, they're taking the consideration of cash flow time of money. And, and think of it this way, a dollar today is not worth the same as a dollar tomorrow. And that's the main thing you have to understand or what, what a, the purchasing power of a dollar today, or, or let, let's even put it as, as simple as this in supermarkets. When we were kids, our parents would go to the supermarkets, they would spend 80 or hundred dollars. Now we go to the supermarket and it's like $500 and you're like, what the hell? And I left with five bags from, from, whole, from what I call whole checks because they take your whole, their own check out. But it's incredible to see that now, you know, $60 does not buy you anything in the supermarket. And IRR will take that discount in consideration over time. That is very important to understand a precise return on investment on your, on your actual money. Now, moving through, here's a perfect calculation. That oh, we, those four, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you have a purchase price of 100000 a yearly NOI of 10000 Right off the bat, this is 10%. We see it, and that would be our cap rate, right? The relationship between these two numbers. Now, if I got a loan for 50%, then that means I only put $50,000. That has nothing to do with the cap rate, right? Cap rate does not, it ignores debt services. It's out of the equation. Now, 50,000 that I put down, okay, at an interest rate of 5%, I have a loan payment of 2,500, right? Now, in order to get my cash on cash, I would now get what my return on investment is, right? Which is I'm paying $10,000 is what it rents for minus what my debt service was for the year. Okay, give me 7,500. Now I divide that by what I invested in 50,000. Look at the return on my cash on cash here. It went up 5% because I used positive leverage. Andres uh, gave me a cheap loan here, I guess, <laughs> and, and, made it, and made it work very positively. You're getting a 15% return on your money. So this particular property, it would be the biggest mistake of your life not to finance because I would make more money. If I would buy two of these properties, I'm making 30% return as opposed to making 20% return. It is, it is astronomical the difference when you really positively leverage situations like this. And this is why it's important to get to understand the cash on cash because that's where upper leverage and information of this nature compiles down to a return that can be very positive. IRR is like I said, I gave $50,000 at the beginning of the investment. It generated 7,500 the first year. Why? $10,000 in income, $2,500 in expenses, 7,500, 7,500, 7,500 by the third year. Now I sold the property and I made 55,000. I paid $50,000 in the property that I owed and I sold for 105. Now my total return on this IRR scenario it's 17.8% annualized, okay? Now you start seeing the difference of how the returns start adjusting and what's a real return. Now ROI is 18%, why? Because it's 5,000 per year, okay? Sorry, 5,000 that I made in the sale plus 22,500, which is 7,500 times three, which gave me this divided by what I, invest, what I invested is 18%. Now, when we're talking about returns of 17, 18, 20, 21%. I don't care if you made a mistake because it's so good that if it's two points you know, of a difference, it is not a big deal whatsoever. Now, when you're talking about a 7% return, a 6% return, you gave me an ROI of that and an IRR brings that down. If you see here, the relationship was, was a mi minor tweak of it, but it brought it down from seven to five. I'm gonna be very upset, guys. You, you're not telling me the right information. And that's what the importance is. An ROI is a good overall number. If it's very big, then there's a lot of leeway to have a mistake in it, right? And that's very important to understand. These are, this is how you calculate the investments. And this is how you see a cap rate, cash on cash, an IRR, and an ROI uh, on that side. Now, continuing to move on, we get to the gross rent multiplier. And a lot of you that have been with us for many, many, many years, always here, Andres and I probably right off the cuff say, how much is it gonna be? How much am I gonna rent it for? 
And what we're looking for and what we tell you guys is look for the 1% rule. This is what off the cuff we're doing is called the gross rent multiplier. And this is basically a ratio of the price of the real estate investment versus, uh, uh, to its annual rental income before accounting or expenses such as anything, property taxes, insurance, utilities, condo fees. What does that mean? If I'm buying a property for $100,000, you should bring me, the 1% rule is $1,000 a month. If you see, we put for you down here, 1% rule is 8.33 GRM, right? That's what we look for when we're identifying these investments and looking for a good deal. So right off the cuff, if the 1% rule exists, 100,000 brings $1,000 a month, it's a very interesting investment to actually analyze and look into uh, because it could be generating anywhere between a four to 6% return. If it's higher than 1%, you're probably between six and 9% return. And if it's lower than 1%, typically, typically, and not always, because you know, if you're, if you're close to 1%, it could be that you're above a better calculation and a better return because there was a cheaper tax incentive there or something you're not seeing off the cuff of your mindset. That's what it is. So basically it's grabbing the gross rent. This rent for a thousand, that's $12,000 a year. 50% goes to vacancy commissions, taxes, insurance, blah, 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 blah. It, you're understanding exactly where you fall, but the, the GRM, is based on the growth. I'm buying 100,000, it produces 12,000. That's, that, that's what it is, that's the 1% rule. And that's where you wanna gauge yourself. Now, the, the multipliers you're typically looking for are anywhere between four and 9%. The, the higher it is at nine, the better of a deal it is for, for you. Because what it's basically saying that if this rents and had zero expenses, it would take you nine years to pay off the investment food right? And our 8.33% is basically the same scenario. It takes us 8.33 years to pay off the investment without any expenses. And again, this is not an, a concrete number that helps you, oh, I'm going to buy it because of this. It helps me and intrigues me on that common denominator. Do I move forward on this or not? Yeah, I think it's a way, it's a good way to, to again, filter from what's out there compared to the rest of what the area has. So you always have to want to benchmark these numbers as to what's the reality in the markets that you're trying to come into. What's normally trading at, what's, what is normally, but yes, the lower that number, the better for the investment for you guys, because it's going to be less time until you pay it all off. And, and you saw the relationship between the, the, the 1% and the gross rent multiplier. Here you see what the gross rent multiplier here in this one was seven, Point thirty-five, which 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 is great. Yeah, it still falls within there. It's less than the one percent, but it was making a hell of a return. So the one percent rule is not always. It's the off the cuff. So now, guys, we're we're moving on to the cash break-even ratio. And I came back here to again align you your mindset back to where we're at. What we're talking about the ratios, and this next one is very important. It's the cash break-even ratio. Okay, what does this tell me? This simply tells me, okay, if I grab all my expenses, right? My reserves and my replacement and divide it by my gross income. What am I spending? So for every dollar coming in, what am I spending? And what you normally look for this equation to be is between 40 to 60% typically. What does that mean? For every dollar that comes in, I spend 40 cents to maintain my investment. I have 60 cents net profit or 60% net profit, if you will, right? So the lower this number is, the better operated your investment is. And not only is it better operated, it has a lot bigger return than a typical investment out there. So 40 yeah. to 60% is- But, but Enrique, you, you're going, you went to the next one. You're talking about the operating expense ratio. This is the cash, this is how much it takes you to be a break even. So how okay. much- so that's the next one you're talking about. This one is basically lenders use this one a lot. You were talking about this one now. I uh, got you. We, we, yeah, you have right. one that comes before. So the cash, the cash break, break even. even. Right. So it's, it, it's you know the the income of the property. How how, how much income will you need to be able to meet the 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 operating expenses to make sure that you're at a, at least at a, at a cash break even point. Exactly. 
what, and you're not you're not you're these, not negative these three are very very similar like andres just, just put that scenario and this is how much income would you need so if you need 40 percent income it means you're running 40 cents on the dollar so that means only 40 percent of the place is rented you're still surviving you're still paying the except uh, yeah this is a, that, that one we just did is a very important ratio to understand why do i need to survive to be above water in worst case scenario is this the level of income that, you know, what, what percentage of the place do I have to be, uh, you know, uh, getting income from to be able to, 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 to navigate my expenses and at least not, not be on a negative scenario. That was exactly. the one that you just did. And, and, if, and you, then, if you look back, guys, you'll see kind of, uh, kind of that these numbers, so the cash break even ratio is here 48%. So if Andres rented this apartment for only half the year, he would still be able to pay all his expenses, right? Correct. And then you have your operation operating uh, ratio, which is 51%, which is the next one. You're going to see that these are very similar, the margin ratio, the cash, because they're, they're the opposite, right? So in this investment, it's basically 50 cents on the dollar is being spent on expenses. And that's why the margin ratio, operation ratio, and cash ratios look kind of the same. But and this is where the 40-60 rule comes into place. You normally spend 40 to 60 cents on the dollar on operating your business or operating your real estate, right? And you're normally making 60 to 40, per, uh, uh, to 40 cents on every dollar coming in. So the expense ratio is all your expenses divided by your gross. And you're looking here between, to be at a healthy point, 40 to 60%, which is the same as the other one. All of these, you're gonna be looking at 40 to 60%. Now the next one, you have your profit margin, right? And again, you're looking for 40 to 60%. So this is basically the relationship between your net income, okay, versus your gross income. No, you, you, I think here you, it was expenses, eh, Andres? No, no, no. That, that, that's fine. It's compared to operating business. That that's basically how much are you? Um, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so this is basically your margin, which is your gross income, your net income by expenses. That's gonna give you exactly how much you're making for every dollar. This is a very important one because to put in perspective what Andres wrote here, a typical business makes eight to 30%, okay? So I own a factory, I make orange juice, I'm selling, and that's a commodity business. That business is probably gonna generate me five to 8%, but it's volume based, right? So if I do a billion dollars and I make you know 5% of a billion, I'm making you know, $5 million, which is a great income, right? But now in other businesses and at the higher end, 30%, which could be restaurants, it could be service oriented businesses, it could be more boutique style businesses that have high profit margins, you're making 30%. Imagine guys, real estate makes you 40 to 60% on your money. It makes you almost double of most regular investments that are there. And when I bring this to light to an investor, it's eye shocking because most of the investors that I work with have their own businesses. And I ask them, hey, so what type of margin do you make in your business? And they're like, well, I bet make 15, 20%. And I go, how about if I were to teach you a way where you're gonna make double or triple that, and all you need to do is knock on a freaking door and collect a check. Now you got the person's attention, right? Yes, the real estate investment requires you know, money to get involved, but there is nothing out there that generates this type of income per dollar and the amount of work that needs to be done that, that coincides together. It's very, it's very difficult to get that. And that's what to me is one of the most attractive things about the real estate investment. It's the profit margin ratio that if I compare across the board in other companies, businesses, industries, it is phenomenal to see the return that we get for every dollar generated. Maybe not for what you actually invest as a whole, but for every dollar coming in. So it's a, it's a, it's a low risk mess up business. It has a lot of Bob, margin for mess up. I just want to make sure you we get it because I just looked at it. You want, I wanted to get, let you speak it. This is the actually right formula because this is the net income, which is the net operating income all the way at the bottom compared to what you're making in rents on the top. So yes, the formula is right. And it's 40 to 60%. That, that's what you're looking at. How much are you making on the top? before all the expenses and this is the, the net income at the end. So, so the formula is correct. It would be the $9,000 that you made at the end in our example, 
you know, divided by what you're making on the top, which are the 20 grand, the, the 18 grand on the top. So, so it is, yeah, that's, that, that, that's the, the formula is correct just to, just to make sure everybody sees it. Yeah, yeah, I guess I saw net more as NOI and I didn't see yeah. NOI. So anyhow, okay, yeah, if, if it's like that, then it works. Okay, so guys, very important one there, no? Now moving on through, you have an efficiency ratio. So an, an efficiency ratio measures the cost per square foot, right? So when we look, let's take a look at this particular investment, right? And we look at an efficiency ratio. All we're doing is saying, what does it cost me? And the efficiency ratio is 9.26, right? That basically is the same as saying it costs me $9.26 per square foot to operate my investment. And this, is, this particular investment rents at, what is it, 1,700 Andres or 1,500? 17, 17, 17. 17, so that's roughly- Minus vacancy. In my head, you're talking about $18 a square foot. I mean, again, Maybe, maybe maybe off by a dollar. Yeah, yeah, because there's vacancy there and stuff. You know? yeah. yeah. So so when you consider that, it's basically again you have fifty percent margin of error before you lose money in your investment is not is no longer a good one. And that's the beauty of it when you start looking at that. Now again, efficiency ratio to me is just a simple number that I know by looking at all these things it usually costs me between eight and ten dollars a square foot to run my 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 units. And I, I think, I think, I think something just to, sorry to call you off very quickly that you got to, to put into perspective here is that these efficiency ratios and operating ratios are very important to be able to let your investor know that a good execution is key because many of the times what, what, what kills your investment is that bad managers of the investment of the inve or the investors that take on this thing by themselves are getting a higher cost to really run this thing because they have to do extra repairs. They have less, you know, more vacancy. They, they don't increase the price of the rent up to market value. They, they end up spending on a lot of other things that make this investment last, last less efficient. So, the, so, so that's why uh, as a manager, we always, you know, when we're managing properties, we're always trying to track these uh, ratios to make sure we're operating at its highest efficiency. There you go. And, and knowing this, again, the common denominator, right? It makes it easy for me to understand, okay, this runs at that, it's $18, I spent nine, and, and I know. And, and then this also helps to find amazing opportunities because I've seen scenarios, and Andres, we, we come across this, where things are just ran crappy and their, their, their expense efficiency ratios are terrible. And that's the biggest opportunity because we're not going in saying, Oh, well, you're spending $18. Oh my God, I can, you should be spending nine because you gave away why you're buying and that's the value add. Me and Andres might come in and say, okay, they're spending 18 and they have their expenses out of control. They probably have family members stealing money. Who knows what the hell's happening, right? But at the end of the day, we know we can operate at nine and that's why we're gonna make a purchase of this because if we operate at nine, we have X, Y, Z return. And those are yeah. the and the cap rate, you end up buying at a, at a higher cap rate right. than, than the reality of their cap rate once you operate it right. Or you end up increasing the cost because there remember, you go. I was going to tell you, most cases, it's, it's a 3% cap price. rate that really looks exactly. that way. But when you put into it, and that's why cap rates are tricky. When they're really low, double check them because their efficiency ratio might be very crappy. And that's the opportunity for us to come in and say, wait, wait. We manage this right, we can bring it all the way down to nine. The cap rate really is not three, it's 7.5%. Let's go ahead and purchase that. And you stole the deal that was just mismarketed and an agent that didn't know. And trust me, guys, the biggest issue we see out in the streets in real estate is that most of the people driving the seat as a realtor has no clue, no clue, absolutely no clue about any of this information. And that's why you're able to negotiate some great deals when you're in control of numbers and you understand this type of information out there. Uh, so take advantage. So the, the, the other one, oh, sorry. Let me go back here. The other one is the- um, Yeah, the last one. It's the debt service coverage ratio. This is very, very important because if you're gonna leverage the investment, this is what the bank looks at at the end of the day to make sure they give you a loan. And yeah. what are they looking at? They're looking at net operating income divided so noi meaning all my expenses all my income everything that's left into the debt service to find the relationship between the two numbers that that ratio and they try to look at 
1.25 to 1.35 to give a loan. The higher the number is, the better and more secure the bank feels in giving you money because why? You have more of a margin of failure, right? To be able to pay them out. So in a pandemic like this, where all these people lost you know, money, you know, a lot of these lenders did this ratio. And if, if you were hit 50%, obviously you were massively hit. But if you only had 20% of your people not pay under this equation, you should be able to pay your mortgage and not be affected at all. Yeah. So the properties must generate a rental cash flow between 25 to 35% more than its rental operating expenses. So let's put that into perspective. It cost me $100,000 to manage my building. My building should be making me $125,000 to $135,000 in order for me to take on a, a debt payment to comfortably be able to manage a scenario like this. This is exactly what banks are, are, are now regretting if they were getting, you know, uh, accepting deals at 1.2, 1.1, because you, you would see them out there to get the deals where the economy is going great. And this is what protects the banks on their investment to make sure you in a bad situation can go in and at least make your, your, debt, your debt responsibility payment. So I, I see this number getting more, more, less aggressive by the banks now that they're, they're going through all this forbearance situation. Yeah. So, so they're going to be more conservative now. Yeah. So, so the leverage effect now, and when we look back, Andres, uh, of the first sheet, uh, this one's levered. No, no, this is the cash. No, one, sorry. That's the one we saw. So you see the, the lever. So now look how interesting this is. The same exact investment Andres presented to you in cash. If I got 50% finance, I made double guys, more than double, double the amount or a, a bit more than double the amount that I would have made guys that I would have made if I got it financed. And think about this. I made double here. And if I would have bought another one, because if I would have had the hundred thousand or the hundred and yeah, the hundred fifty thousand, I would have bought two of these guys, two of these will end up now, two of these will end up making me 44%, not 22. So I double the amount of money that I made across the board all around just by simply leveraging the investment guys. And this is the beauty, beautiful, beautiful part about real estate. It is the only industry and avenue you can invest in, use collateralize, and most of the time position yourself on a positive investment right. opportunity uh, that's there. And all, all Andres did here is if you see on the loans of the term, he basically put in a loan, he put in an interest rate, he put in the down payment, and he did the monthly expenses on that loan. And by taking all that into consideration, look at the debt service ratio, 1.64%. Banks would love to lend Andres the money if this was the case you'll find the money very easily because there's a very, very secure ability to pay the debt without any problems. Now, cash flow wise, yes, he made a lot less than he would in cash, but percentage of return, he made more. Now, if you compare this, and I think this is important, I'm making here, a, to, 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 I can't scroll down on this. What's the cash flow there in the bottom? No, no, it's on the top. You see the cash flow there? It's seven hundred and sixty-three dollars a month on cash flow, and two and two ninety and two ninety-seven a month. But what's on the top? You know, the top circle in the middle of the top circle. Yeah, so two ninety-seven a month. Go back. Two ninety-seven a month instead of seven sixty-three, uh, which yearly. You, you know, your, your your growth of cash, and this one is fifty-one thousand dollars. And look at the other one. Uh, and this one is twenty thousand dollars. Your gross of cash you, you, on the on the five years right here. Uh, look, look, right here. You know, twenty thousand dollars versus fifty one thousand dollars. But the big difference here is that the number you're basing this off is fifty five thousand only as your total investment, and not a hundred and fifty five. So you're just using a third of your money to generate these returns and so, the cash on cash keeps on being more because you're comparing 297 against 55 and not against 155. No, no, and, and now let's catapult that, right? Because let's say the person had 155. That means he would buy three apartments like this. Correct. So three times two is I'm making more cash flow or the same amount of cash flow as investing the 155 in cash, but now I'm getting appreciation of 5% 
in three apartments. So my total amount of income, or sorry, asset is not 150, it's 150 times three, which would be $450,000 at 5% appreciation. I am compounding my investment return and I am still with three apartments making the same cash flow as one. Now, guys, something, something very important here. Do, do you guys remember at the beginning that we said that the three quadrants were income, appreciation, and then leverage and equity? This is what makes leverage and equity so important to catapult the good investments. You have to be very careful with leverage and equity because now you have a big partner that can take away your property if you don't manage this right or if you over leverage or do things wrong and become uh, and go into a market where you can't rent well, you have too much leverage and you can't control your cash flow to have a break even ratio when things go bad. Whereas when you have the property paid in cash, you don't owe anything to anybody. So that's one caveat that I want to be able to understand, uh, get everybody understand. So leverage is great. Once you understand that the mechanics of the type of loan you're getting and the type of investment you have are good and worth it, number one, because if not, it will really make your investment much worse than what it was if you look at a bad investment that then goes leveraged. And the other important piece is you have to make sure that you're able to qualify for loans. So having, you know, when you qualify for loans and the, the debt, you know, uh, coverage ratio, it's one very important figure to look at in these type of investments, because it doesn't matter if, if, you're, if your property looks very well in the other scenarios, if it doesn't have a good debt coverage ratio, they won't give you the money. That's number one. And number two, when you're doing little properties like this. The strategy, we're going to give it to you now because you will not be able to go to a bank with an investor from Colombia and get them 10 properties putting $50,000 when you purchase them because the bank won't lend you the money as you purchase. So the way you do this type of thing and the way we did it all along through these investment years that we have doing, been doing it with, perp, with clients is they need to have the, and that's why the expectation is important. They need to put up the cash up front. They need to buy all the assets. They need to start getting producing as producing assets. And then you go to the bank and get a loan for the portfolio because now the bank is not lending them an, a foreign national loan to buy a property. The bank is lending a commercial loan or a blanket mortgage for a set of properties. And then you take out the full equity uh, leverage from the properties that are already producing cash on cash returns and debt to income ratios that you can prove to the bank. Make sense? Yeah, no, no, 100%. And, and I think, Andres, just to show, uh, you know, a little bit of pain in the gain, you know, what is it saying? No pain, no gain. Uh, you know, having the finance leveraging yourself, uh, obviously, you, have, you owe the money to the bank, you got to be careful. And in these areas, it's worth, uh, uh, we will show you soon, uh, it's worth getting the positive leverage because of the return. And one of the interesting things that I would always tell you is I always analyze everything buying a cash at the beginning. I yeah. first want to make sure it works on cash. And if it Very works important. on cash, then I introduce leverage and I see if it works on leverage because we might get very confused here. You see, I might have a great return that if I put financing into it, it's terrible. Agreed. And, and that doesn't mean it's a bad investment because, hey, if I'm making 5 or 6%, Andres, on my money, I'm a very happy candidate. And yeah. with that 5 or 6% that I'm making on my money, um, if I leverage it, now I'm making 2% and now I have the lending, like you said, and I had all this and that, that the money, that doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather keep it cash. So never do that. Always look at it cash first, then introduce leverage to see. And what might happen, you might say, well, my client only has a down payment. He can't afford the whole entire thing then if leverage is not positive enough to make that investment happen, don't move forward on it. Just move to the next one and continue to look till you find that debt coverage ratio that is between what Andres is telling you, 1.2 to 1 1.5 uh, on that side. Okay? Agreed. So, uh, I, I love the fact, I see some questions here. They're asking us, Andres, yeah. and I would really take a quick second to do this. Yeah, let's Let's go see to us the if question. we can send them the sheet. Guys, for those, I mean, sending you a PDF sheet, we'd be more than happy for the non-Avanti way agents that are with us right now. But guys, and, and Andres, just run us through this very quick and have it for yeah. those agents. All of you that have, it, have uh, and that are in Avanti way, all this is in a very simple form for you. 
You fill it out, it does all the calculations, and this is what walk us through in the screen, and you walk out with an incredibly professional uh, report before we get into this. Andres, I see several yeah. people. Yeah, I know, I'm going there, I'm going there now. I'm just trying to, to get this out of here. Okay, I'm out. So all guys, right, so look at it cash as Andres goes in, okay? Then play with leverage. And I start, don't put a lot of leverage first, put little leverage. What happens if I get 40%? What happens if I get 50%? What happens if I get 60% of the load? What happens if I get 70? What happens if I get to 80? I go all the way up to 100, even though I'll never get 100. What that ends up doing to me is that if I can 100% leverage this investment and it's still giving me money, it's a hell of a good investment that's there. And that's, again, creating that air logic tight uh, argument or, or not argument, but, but ability to give the investor the information they need of why they want to move forward. And look how simple this is, guys. Walk us through this, Andres. Yeah, so, so basically what, what you're going to be able to do is as you go into AVEX, you go into where it says investment report down here, okay? And once you're inside the investment report area, you're going to come here. If you want uh, to learn how to do this, uh, just click here on the play button. You know that in any section of AVEX, you have the play buttons that will allow you to just click and we'll show you the video. This one, for example. Hey guys, is sorry, Andres. I'm going to have to cut it short because the insurance co company is calling me. Okay. Uh, I love sharing the moment with you. Andres will finish it off right now. I think yeah. you're almost done. Thank you so yes. much, guys. Thanks, Enrique. All right. So, so I'll, I'll finish it off. And, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of at the end of it. And we'll try to address some of the questions you have. But uh, I just want to show you here, if, if you play this video, it will take you step by step on how to do it and what to put in each, each, each part, just as in any other place. But this is when you set up everything that we just described and it'll take you through the whole uh, process. This is where you put the opportunity. You can add even the picture of the building or the, or the space. This is where you put the general information on the price. Um, so just go through this video that, so you, you understand how to fill this out. Um, it's gonna take you through the loan and leverage information here, the closing costs, future sale information. This area of the income, it's very interesting because you can add as many as many uh, types of units. And you can say, for example, if this is a building, you can say there's four or five bedroom units, uh, three two bedrooms, eight one bedrooms, et cetera. And then you put how much each of them rents for. And plus you have a laundry area that rents for this, et cetera. And you put the full income that you can get here. You can add any notes for the investor. And then you put all your expenses whether it's a commercial building, a residential building, a multifamily, a single unit, you just add all your investments here. If you want to add more and more, you have the add section here to add any, any investment that you want. Uh, you can put it by month here and then it puts it by, by year. You could put it by percentage and it'll put it by year. This gives you the, you see the expense uh, ratio right here. And then as you come in, once you set up one investment, I would tell you come in here, and clone that investment. Just hit where it says clone. And if you do that, you can already leave that you know, type of investment set up with all your costs and everything that you usually use. And then go ahead and confirm, call it differently. And that way you have uh, that template to be used for the different ones. And then you can save the different types of investment with different templates. And you don't have to go through all the numbers and all the specifics every time. You let, you let it uh, with all the variations or filters or, or assumptions that you usually use. This will give you then the value information. This will give you all the expenses of how much your expenses. So I saw a question there that what happens with insurance and taxes. So here you have, for example, insurance and taxes are here, are part of your expenses that are considered for your NOI. These are all parts of your expenses. The $15,000 a year here include the taxes, and include the insurance. The, what you're not including is definitely the um, uh, taxes on your income, like the income tax, because that's why with your structure, depending on what else you have, depending on how this fee, fee, feeds into your general tax structure, it will vary from investor to investor. So you cannot include that there, but it does include the loan, you know? Here you have the same variables that you see on the investment side on the, on the actual report. And here you have even waterfall stru structures that help you uh, with the investor visualize, you know, when on your cash flow, this is how much money you come, you bring you in. 
between what you got, what you should be getting minus your vacancy, minus your mortgage, minus your management, your association, your rent, your taxes, your insurance, your repairs, whatever you're putting into your deal. And then it gives you a revenue per year. And then you have your projection, what it sells for, less your mortgage, less your closing costs, less your initial investment, plus your growth, plus your rental cash flow. It gets you to your total gain. Now, when you want to generate the report, you can always update, you can clean it, you can delete it, but you remember, clone it, it's very important. You can set defaults. If you change anything, you want to send, change it back to the default. The report here will give you two types of report. The detailed report that you guys saw, which will, will, will open up as you click your detail, will come out. And here you have the detailed report, which gives you also another area first that gives you the information of this particular property with your name and information. Then it gives you the report that we just went through with all the ratios and everything else. And then it gives you another page that gives you also the graphs that allow the investor to visualize with you the information very well. If you just want to have uh, a quick view of the reports, which are used when you're sending several types of investments for the investor to choose, it has a summarized version that just gives you this. And, and, and you put the information, you put uh, the property and what, what it's yielding and the specifics. So the investor can at the end, you know, decide, you know, whether or not to move forward and see more details and all that you do this uh, right here. Uh, so, so this, this uh, tool can get you to do anything from a very simple investment, like the one we showed it with. So we make it, made it, made it, you know, more digestible to any other commercial residential but the basics of what you've learned today are all the same the 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 way that you calculate the value of these investments you know dividing the net operating income uh, divided by the cap rate that the area is giving and that giving you the right value at which you should purchase the property or not it's all the same in whatever type of investment you do the little nuance of this type of particular investment that we really recommend for for investors, uh, for having a resilient, um, you know, diversified residential portfolio is that the value of the sale is not necessarily driven with the um, um, cap rate uh, uh, trading, but is, you know, being able to sell it. And that's a very unique part of, of this type of investments besides being diversified, that you sell it to a, final user that it's looking at their value to rent versus the value to own. We have other webinars in which we explain this strategy inside out, and it's a good way to start analyzing these. But all those ratios you can get by just going through this exercise. I really encourage you guys to be looking at this and also to go in and, and look at a pool of properties and try to dig down to see where are the investments now that I should be looking into, you can start using the 1% rule, the gross rent multiplier to try to see where should I be looking to really dig in deeper on these type of investments. So basically, this is what I wanted to kind of showcase as far as this. And uh, one second, let me go back here for a second. What I wanted to show you on this part of it, give me a quick second. To finish it off, one, one thing before I go into the questions that I did want to show you is remember, remind you the following. When you're dealing with investments, please always and explain to your investors openly, you do not look for opportunities. Every, really, every realtor out there is trying to find opportunities and every investor is trying to get their realtors or advisors to get them opportunities. You have to try to shift them from being an advisor or a, or a commission-driven agent that looks for an opportunity once and shifts them into an agent that really becomes their money manager for the real estate and try to grow to maximize a portfolio over time with a strategy. So not a one-time service, get a constant service, not be product-based, be execution-based, you know, not be limited, be unlimited. When you're able to deliver this value, you are able to really uh, show them the way to start slow investing with you, trusting you, present to them the team that you have behind you on the state planning, on the financing side, on the execution of the management, on the money management, and on the, the execution of the rentals and the sales 
and, and, and the vendors and, and, and the insurance and everything else to give you a good efficiency ratio, good operating ratio, and be able to then see when is the right time to leverage from an investment, put money somewhere else, and make that investment grow over time. That is the key when you're talking to, the, to these investors. So it's not about being an order taker, it's about understanding these numbers. And with this webinar, we don't expect you guys to now be experts on these numbers, but now know what you need to become an expert on and, and know where to look for. All these formulas, all these numbers are common lingo. You can go, you have videos explaining them, you have a, 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 you know, explanations in different documentation. And please, anybody that, that, that wants to look at these, um, this presentation also, just know that we'll have them inside our university when you go to education, inside education. Uh, we already have this section here where it says 2020 focus strategy. If you go here, you have different strategies and one of them is the investor strategy where you have a four hour you know, set training that, that I gave last year and inside here, you have a download button for a presentation that gives a lot of this information. And then if you go to the investor section here, uh, you have other investor um, trainings and things to get more educated on. And you have also this presentation that will be placed there. For all the participants, we'll all also send you within the email of uh, thanking you for, the, for, for participating. We'll send you the information. And if you're not within Avanti Way, please write us an email to Avanti Way, Andres Corda at avantiway.com so we can connect with you and send you the information as well from the presentation and any materials that we discussed today. So um, we, we, we're, we're kind of you know, past uh, one o'clock. We don't want to make this too, too, uh, too dense. Uh, I know it's dense when, when we look at numbers. But uh, if, if, if you guys want to, I could, I could answer a couple questions in the chat. Um, you know, let, let me just go in and see if there's anything here that I could address before we, we, we let you guys go um, that we haven't addressed. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for participating. And it, it, it's really a pleasure. Hopefully it was useful for all of you uh, today, no? Uh, so let me see. So the insurance we spoke about. Uh, the 1031 exchange, I, I see Eduardo under, uh, you know, answered for us there, a good exit strategy for, for the taxable profit. Again, have a good tax attorney. Uh, we, we, again, a, a have within our, our network a great, great people that you can surround yourself with. They're all part of the affiliates. Uh, you know, connect with our support, you know, agent, agent support, VAP, ask them to to, to, if you can't find it in AVEX, which is there by the agent services section in the, under the affiliates, be able to uh, do a meeting with them. They will be able to sit down with you and explain and sit with any of your clients as well. Let me see if I see anything else here that I could you know, touch upon. Um, we will send you the investment metric sheets with the information. Don't you worry, we will get that going. Um, a maximum amount of condo association that an investment should have. If you're looking for this type of middle market investment specifically, uh, the one that similar to the one that we that we um, outlined in the current market conditions right now, the rule of thumbs that we're seeing is that the investment should not be over two hundred thousand dollars as an investment to work with the best um, uh, variables of expense, unless there's other things that they want to do with the property, uh, with the same best variables of returns. And the association should not be more than $250 a month. You should really try to keep that below $250 a month. It's our recommendation right now for the numbers to work uh, as optimal in, in, in the cash, in, in, within the you know, five to 6% cash on cash uh, and, and being able to, to have a annualized eight to 12% without leverage. So that, you know, try to keep it in around the $200, $200 a month for associations. Um, they're asking about areas. Listen, uh, again, depends on the, the, the different areas of, of, of the United States have different variables. If we're talking South Florida, where we're at, the, the places where you try to find, you know, those started investor properties on the one, 100 to $200,000 range that become resilient to these type of downturns, 
and have these type of, uh, you know, a four to six percent cash on cash, eight to twelve percent annualized return on leveraged. I would tell you West Miami. Once you hit Palmetto, all across, if you go all the way up north to to, and you hit West of Palmetto, is where you find a lot of these uh, properties. You know, West Kendall, uh, Miramar, uh, you know, Pembroke, and if you go up to Broward and those areas are, are up there in Coral Springs, et cetera. And if you go down here in, uh, in Dade, you would have a West Kendall, Hammocks, uh, Miami Lakes has some, Hialeah Gardens, uh, Old Cotler, the Cotler, Cotler Bay area. Uh, you, you, could, you, know, you could even go all the way up to the, to the Homestead Corridor and you have uh, all that site uh, becomes interesting. Fontainebleau was really good for a very long time, the Fontainebleau area in West Miami. It, it, it became more pricey now, but you can still find uh, deals there. Um, uh, okay, what do we do with the operating expenses in the analysis? What do we add the insurance? It's all there. Uh, you, you'll see it there. You can add insurance. You can add anything. Hopefully, now that I showed the system, you could check on that and test it. A percentage for taxes. Again, I always try to be conservative and put 2%. You could put between 1.5 and 2.3 percent, depending on on what what how conservative or not you want to be. If you want to just give me a, if you want to just make it very simple, just put two percent on property taxes, and, and and you should be okay. One thing about property taxes, though, make sure if the community is built after 2010 that you're buying, you really want to check the tax uh, documents, uh, the property tax of the property, and make sure they are not non in taxes because those properties had what it's called, many of those are C CDD, which was a, um, it's a tax that it's, it's actually a, a funding from the government to be able to help as an incentive, the developers build, but then the, the, the cost of all that, those new roads and that new area that they built and all those incentives then gets passed through in a tax bill that's called non in tax to the actual property owner. So, you know, when you're buying an investment, the tax rate there that could go up to up to 4% and that will kill your investment numbers. So look at look at that very well if you're buying a recent property. That, that, that's a, a good advice that, that, that I think you, you guys will, will, will uh, value once you find something like that. Um, let me see. A multiplying number of vacant units by 100 divided by the total units in the building. I think that somebody just, Answering the question, I already answered that one about what areas. Uh, news about New York and Texas coming to invest to uh, COVID. Uh, th this is actually very, very true. It is happening. Uh, Florida is 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 in a very attractive state for people that have money or people that need more space, but also want the the weather and the the, the tax efficiency and the 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 cosmopolitan lifestyle at the same time uh, so yes you you will potentially see more more buyers coming from those places given covid uh, so just be in the lookout at the end of the day you have to learn all these things become an advisor you know be relevant to your communities and to your investor database and and and, and, and provide great content and those buyers will start looking at you as a, as, a, as somebody to talk to a uh, good way to get to all these type of investors is to have great relationships with money managers, with insurance agents, with uh, attorneys, and, and, and be able to demonstrate to them that you know what you're doing and you have a group that is backing you up that really knows what they're doing and, and they will start referring you a lot of the business because those are the first people, those family offices, money managers that now are having you know to take those questions from their international clients on what's going on. So become that resource and use everything that we guys were giving you to, to really be relevant to them. Um, do I think the prices will, will go down? Again, we, we've spoke about all these things uh, before, uh, and, and this is a changing monster as it goes, uh, but, but right now, uh, prices are not really coming down. Uh, we're in a position where uh, you have per, partic a particular places in the market where people are desperate of liquidity and situations and particular product that was really desperate to sell right before the problem. And now they just need to unload. You will have 
especially in the commercial end, uh, in the in non-industrial, but in the office and retail end, you will have some people that were, did not have good efficiency ratios or debt cover ratios and now are in a deep problem once the bank stops uh, helping them through, through, through forbearance, if they cannot ramp up the income, they will have to really uh, displace their assets and you will see some great opportunities of those changing hands. On the residential side, it's a bit more resilient, but you will have some investors that have issues in their countries and need liquidity and they either have to refinance or really uh, take out you know, uh, money from their property. So you will see opportunities, they will come. Uh, I think right now we haven't seen them yet at that level because the forbearance is just helping people navigate through. So you just have to keep your eye on the ball and be very, very good at analyzing product and keeping your investors on the sidelines. So a good thing that we're recommending now to our investors is guys, prep up. Now get your money allocated. Make sure that you put it aside to, to wait for the right investment. Be in connection with us. Set up your structure. It's a good time to do all those other pieces and you guys to get better and better at the numbers that we're giving to you because the, the investments, once they start hitting, they're going to be fast and your people need to be structured and already working with you so they take advantage. If not, you're going to just get the tail end of it. And, and, and you know, once, once everybody sees the investments, it's a little bit too late to get on the right time. But once those start coming in, you will have a long, you know, tail to really come in. And as long as your structure is right and your numbers make sense, you're never gonna be the one buying the lowest of the market. But if the numbers work and make sense for cash flow, for the purposes of their investments, of, of, of their returns that they're looking at, for the trajectory and all the questions that we asked at the beginning, you're gonna put them in the sound investment on the realities of the market at that point. You're not Superman, you're not gonna give them returns that don't exist. So manage your expectations right and be there to allocate sound investments. In every market, they're good investments. So right now, they're gonna be interesting ones. You just have to be ready to, to, to take, take them on. But, but you know, the, the investments are always going to be there. It's just trying to find them and, 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 and meet the, the, the goal of your investor with the right product uh, for, for, for the right expectation. That, that, that's about it. And we're here to help you, whatever you guys need, just, just keep, us, keep us posted, no? I think, I mean, I, I, I pretty much answered most of the ones that you asked here. Uh, the legal structure, again, uh, what do we recommend for foreign nationals? It's a hard to say. That's the last one that I saw there. Uh, I can tell you who can help you with the legal structure. We, within our affiliates, we have uh, ASI Financial um, that, that is great uh, to sit down with you guys. Uh, just contact there, Peter Tinoco. He's in our brick hole location and you'll do a Zoom meeting with you, your clients, go through your, your, your specifics because, again, it's not a one size fits all. It will probably not be buying on a personal name. You got to be very careful with that. But it will be, you know, a combination of things. You have estate planning issues if you die versus tax issues versus anonymity issues versus you know, uh, the, the tax rate change issues, the, the cost of the structure. You might not want to pay so much for the structure. You might want to be less protected, but enough protected and pay a little bit less. Um, offshore versus, versus, you know, the, the, all those things change and you got to be with the right um, advisor. But the team is there to help you out. So thank you guys. If you have other questions, please feel free to, to let us know. Hopefully this was informative and you guys, uh, we added some value to you. Uh, thank you for, for participating and, and we see you guys very soon. Get it going, be an advisor, be a resource. Look forward to doing a lot more of these for you guys. Thank you.